Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome back to the second day of the high-level event celebrating the 10 years of IAFA. Uh, delighted to see so many of you uh, back with us uh, for uh, a packed morning of uh, events. Um, so um, we have the, if we can have the next slide with the agenda for the morning. Just to run through, so we will start off the day today um, with some updates on IAFA um, and Pact for Skills. Um, and then we will move to our third panel of the event, which is focusing on a topic which, was, which came up many times uh, yesterday, um, so the topic of adult apprenticeships. After that, we will have a coffee break. Um, and then we will move to the fourth and final panel of the event. Um, so looking at apprentices as agents for a sustainable future. Uh, and then we have the closing remarks, and that will be the end um, for those of you who are participating in the high-level event. Of course, in the afternoon, those of you who are continuing with the IAFA get-together event will continue in the afternoon. So to start um, the day, with no further ado, uh, we will come to the session um, looking at the updates on IAFA and Pact for Skills. So before I introduce our first speaker, who will be talking uh, about the updates on Pact for Skills, um, perhaps just a very brief introduction for Pact for Skills. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with the Pact for Skills. Um, it is one of the flagship actions of the European Skills Agenda, which was launched in 2020. The pact aims to support public and private organisations with upskilling and reskilling so they can thrive through the green and digital transitions. And what it offers members, um, among others, is access to knowledge on upskilling and reskilling needs. It offers advice on relevant funding instruments to boost the skills of adults in their regions and countries. And it offers partnership opportunities within the growing community of members. Um, so in order to give us an update on where we are, um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, to the stage Deanna Spiridon, who is Team Leader for Adult Skills in Unit B2 at DG Employment. Thank you very much, Deanna. Thank you very much, Vicky, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just to say that I'm very honored to uh, open this second day of the, of the event uh, and very, very happy to be here together with the AFA community and to see you know, many of the, the colleagues, the, the, the people that I, I worked for quite some years as part of the, the commission team following the, the AFA and a special, uh, uh, let's say, hello or you know, to the apprentices in the European Apprentices Network that was also, let's say, one, uh, one of the, the group that I, uh, I very much invested my, my work and efforts for quite some time. But now, to go back to the Pact for Skills. Um, so indeed, the, the Pact for Skills is, um, is gaining momentum, um, launched in November 2020. Uh, today, there are um, 18 large-scale skills partnerships uh, in all the 14 industrial ecosystems as defined by the renewed EU industrial strategy. Um, we have uh, a few recent partnerships that were launched in the, in the past uh, two, three months. Um, just to name them very quickly, uh, renewable energies, long-term care, uh, space, um, data services and applications, and energy intensive industries. And uh, there are a few more are under uh, preparation still for this year. Uh, together, uh, these partnerships are committed to offer opportunities for upskilling and reskilling to at least 10 million people for the coming years. And uh, we also have over 1,500 organizations uh, from all member states uh, that have individually joined the pact and um, include a, a wide range of, of stakeholders, like from businesses, social partners, to public authorities and training providers. And also among the, the PACT members, we also have a growing number of, of regional authorities and stakeholders um, of regional dimension. <clears throat> because the focus of the PACT now is really getting closer to 
where we see the, the need for skills are really at regional and local level. And we have also heard yesterday that also in the AFA, a similar approach is, is taken because really this is where matching the, the, the specific skills uh, that companies and businesses need with people aspirations. So this is where we see it's more, more effective. So we are currently working with um, uh, a number of networks and, and associations of, of regions to really get the message through to the regional authorities and engage them in the, in the pact. And we also build on existing synergies with other initiatives and, and cooperation uh, platforms. So just very briefly to, to say that the pact really takes a, an open approach to, uh, to establishing regional partnerships uh, because we let's say we do not limit to, we don't have a very, you know, set framework. We say that, okay, a regional partnership can be established in one single region or local territory. It can be also um, set up as, as a, co a cooperation between neighboring regions, uh, also across uh, uh, borders, or it can be also col a collaboration between regions or local authorities in multiple countries, which, uh, you know, can maybe share economic characteristics. For the time being, we have uh, established, uh, we have two uh, regional partnerships running. We have the Lombardy region in Italy and the European Chemical Regions uh, Network, and a few more partnerships are, are under preparation. So we hope to, to be launched soon. So basically the key element for all these partnerships are really bringing together the public and the private stakeholders to, to take concrete action. And for that, we use some of uh, enablers, as, as, we, as we call them. So first of all, we have the, the packed support services. So basically at regional and local level, the support services can assist the skills partnerships through networking activities and also by providing tailored uh, guidance. Well, just to say that this type of, of services are also available for the large scale skills partnerships, but I think it's even more important now for the, the regional and local partnerships, as we see that you know they, they may need also, let's say, more um, or additional support. Um, we also have other initiatives that promote uh, skills, uh, cooperation on skills with EU funding, like for example, we have the Erasmus Plus Blueprint project or the Centers of Vocational Excellence, as you, you have heard also in the discussions yesterday. And speaking about EU funding, uh, we all know that a wide range of, of opportunities for, for funding to support skilling, so upskilling, reskilling at all levels are available. But of course, it, they need to be, to be used, so we very much uh, encourage uh, and try to help stakeholders to make full use of these um, opportunities. Now, the PACT is also delivering with impact on the, on the ground, so uh, we see that PACT members are, are, are very active in developing skills and supporting uh, their commitments. So uh, we have um, uh, recently published the annual survey of the, um, of the work of the, in the PACT, so covering uh, 2022, uh, where we see that uh, the, mem the members who, who responded to the survey declared that their efforts together uh, for up and reskilling uh, actions had reached an estimate of uh, almost 2 million individuals. Um, they have also made an aggregated investment of 160 million into upskilling, reskilling activities. We see that uh, um, over 15,000 training programs were either updated or, or newly developed. Uh, close to 19 million people were reached by promotion activities and also that stakeholders, many of the stakeholders that are external of the PAC, so over 21,000 um, stakeholders were involved into collaboration with, um, with the PAC members. So, of course, while these figures are estimates, because as I said, they are, um, the information is collected via a, a survey, so it's really based on the, the declaration of the, of the respondents, we can already say that there are really significant efforts um, happening in the in the in the PACT community, and uh, uh, as I said, members uh, many of the members are very very uh, active in um, putting in practice uh, the concrete action to which they committed. And now, before I close, uh, just a few words on uh, how we see the synergies between the AFA and the and the PACT for skills. Um, one very promising area is the cross promotion of the of the events and of the work we do. So um, we have um, invited the AFA members to 
um, join one of the, the last uh, meetings we had, the, the networking event, which is really one of the, the largest events that we organize uh, every year. So a networking event for potential new members that took place at the end of, of May. And similarly, this event uh, has been also promoted among the, the, the PACT members. And um, what we also uh, started to do, like starting with uh, September last year, uh, all organizations that are registering to become members of the PACT are also asked about their EAFA membership. And if we, say that, if we see that they answer that you know, they, they are not yet EAFA members, we also invite them to, to learn more and, and we direct them to the, um, to the EAFA website. So um, again, we, will, we really see there is quite a lot of, of, of potential benefits from uh, this cross-promotion of activities, but also uh, reflecting on other possibilities of, of, uh, of work between the, or collaboration of the initiatives. And as we have heard also yesterday, and I know today it's also on the agenda of the discussion, uh, one area of work is indeed to see how apprenticeships um, can be used to upskill and reskill the people of working age, and of course, contributing together with uh, the pact also to the EU level um, target on, on adults participating in, in learning. And just my very last uh, slide, just to give an example, uh, some examples of, of PACT members that are declaring they are also EAFA members. So we see a number of public authorities, association of vet providers, um, social partners, companies. And uh, just to go back yes, uh, to, to what happened yesterday, so uh, three of the, of the newcomers in the EAFA that were on stage, uh, yesterday, they are also members in the, in the pact, so uh, the region of Emilia-Romagna, the Bukovina Institute in Romania, and the Turismo de, de Portugal, which is also one uh, member of the tourism large-scale partnership in the pact. And just also for information, on the, you can see on the, the right uh, uh, side of the slide some of the AFA members that participated in the last networking event of the pact. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and really hope to, to see many of you joining also the Pact for Skills community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. And as we can see, so many synergies between uh, the two initiatives. So those of you who are not involved in, in the Pact for Skills yet do find out do find out more about it as Diana has been encouraging you. Um, so to get updates on IAFA, uh, I now have the pleasure um, to invite um, to the stage Anna Barbieri, who is um, team leader for apprenticeships and Erasmus Plus at Unit B3 in DG Employment. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my task is uh, easy because yesterday and today it has all been about uh, apprenticeships. So I will just give uh, a short update uh, and uh, some reminders to you. In 2023, we see that uh, we have a lot of actions concerning the Alliance and also some reflections to take stock of the fact that the, Ali the European Alliance for Apprenticeship is 10 years uh, young, so I don't say old. Uh, and indeed, we have seen yesterday, as mentioned by the speakers, that uh, uh, there is a lot of momentum in the EAFA and also the champions that were presented yesterday evening as we have witnessed how much uh, the EAFA is important for them. So far in 2023, we have welcomed 20 new members. Some of them were there yesterday for the signing ceremony. I will remind you that 65 EAFA members have renewed their pledges and uh, seven countries have renewed their national commitments and more of them are in the process of doing so. There is a document on the site of this uh, event where you can find the list of all the organizations, the new pledges and the renewals. Um, what we have done so far also in 2023, we have organized a webinar on uh, apprenticeships for the care sector and the social economy, which is linked to two major initiatives of DG employment. 
And this week, we will publish a fact sheet on financial support to apprenticeships in the EU and also to apprentices, to financial support to apprentices, with some examples from Austria, Denmark, Portugal, Sweden, Croatia, and other countries. And also we uh, have examples of how ESF Plus and Erasmus Plus are supporting apprenticeships. Uh, concerning Erasmus Plus, we are trying to build more synergies with the program as far as apprenticeships are concerned because we think that um, the Erasmus Plus program can provide a good, a major support for uh, in, uh, mobility, for example, and also for transnational cooperation projects concerning apprenticeships. So I invite you to study a little bit the site of Erasmus Plus as well. And after the summer, there will be a fact sheet coming out that will provide some inspiration featuring some Erasmus Plus projects on apprenticeships to show you how the program is being used in the field of apprenticeships. We will also work to, by the end of the year on micro-credentials for apprenticeships and we will also have work on the renovation wave and the green transition to the, of the construction sector. And then I build on what uh, Diana has been saying earlier. We are also reflecting on the synergies with the Pact for Skills. Uh, even if uh, the Alliance for Apprenticeship is a very specific uh, initiative with a very specific focus, we think that uh, uh, there are a lot of benefits in joining forces with the Pact for Skills. And we are looking into how we can simplify and facilitate the work of the organizations that are or will become members of both the networks. There, is some more, there are some more news. There is a new opportunity for networking that will be offered through the AFA communities. There are four that are being created on, uh, on different topics, green and digital transition, mobility of apprentices, social inclusion and needs, and also a group on cities and regions. Um, these communities are led by AFA members, four members, so I invite you to join the AFA if you are not yet a member and also join one or more of these communities where you have the possibility to discuss with other organizations that are working in these areas. Next week, uh, on Monday, we will have an info session reminding everyone what are the features of the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. It will be for members that have newly joined or for potential new members. Maybe some Pact for Skills members could also join uh, this event to learn more about the benefits of the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. And then I come to my last uh, reminder uh, after this meeting uh, yesterday and today, the next uh, uh, event linked to the European Alliance for Apprenticeship will take place in Torino in October in cooperation with the ETF, and it will be uh, the eighth seminar of uh, candidate countries, ETF partner countries, who will be meeting with other EAFA members and learn from one another. So, my last point would be to thank you for your attention and also for your engagement in the European Alliance for Apprenticeship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna, for this very clear overview and reminders uh, and news uh, on EAFA. Um, so I invite you to, to take part in, in all these different uh, activities. Thank you once again to Diana also um, for this session. I think some very useful uh, thoughts for, for the day. Um, so without further ado, we will move to our third panel of the event, the first of the day. And as mentioned earlier, this is a panel uh, which will focus on a topic um, which has become uh, increasingly visible, increasingly important, and has been mentioned a lot already uh, during this event, and it's the topic of adult uh, apprenticeships. Um, so the panel will be facilitated by Anna Carrero, 
who is Deputy Head of Unit of Unit B3 at DG Employment. Um, so welcome, Anna, to the stage. Um, <laughs> and we'll hand over to you for this session. Thank you, Anna. Yes, I... I already invite uh, Jürgen, Pilby, and Lina to come with me. We have a fourth uh, panelist that will be joining online, uh, Petri Lampinen from Finland. Um, we still, uh, he had a, a hiccup uh, with his trip, but we still wanted him today with us because he has a lot to say on this topic, and uh, it is a privilege for us to, to have him on board. So. Thanks a lot. I'm very glad to be here uh, to introduce this very uh, topical issue. You heard yesterday uh, that this is uh, uh, creating an increase in interest. Uh, social partners and other stakeholders have um, indicated that they really want to have this on the agenda as a topic to be further explored and, and promoted. So we thought this was the perfect occasion uh, to talk about it, uh, to discuss about it, and uh, we are are really lucky to have a great panel uh, today uh, with us. We have Jürgen Siebel, you know him very well. He's the executive director of CETEFOP, our decentralized agency to promote vocational education and training skills and qualifications. You've done uh, a lot of research and you have many publications on the topic, so your insights uh, will be very welcome. We have uh, Lina Constantinopoulou. Uh, di uh, policy director in Euro Chambers, an organization which is gathering uh, chambers of uh, commerce and industry in Europe, representing over 20 million businesses, and will also uh, give us uh, this very important angle uh, from the businesses side. And then we have Pilvi Torsti. I think you already know her. Uh, she is director of the European Training Foundation, a decentralized agency promoting skills development in neighboring uh, countries. But she also has a lot of experience uh, when it comes to apprenticeships because she used to work on this very specific topic in Finland when the Youth Guarantee was launched there and later uh, was the inspiration of our EU policy on Youth Guarantee with apprenticeships as a key, uh, one of the key offers um, of this. And finally, we have Petri. I don't know if we can see him, but uh, he is a director uh, for upper uh, secondary education and uh, vocational education and training in the Ministry of Education in Finland. And uh, it is, um, uh, he will share very interesting insights because Finland is a country with a high share of adult apprenticeships in, in their system. So maybe bef before we start uh, with the discussion, uh, we have a small poll uh, for you uh, to tell us what you think, uh, why you think we need to encourage this very specific um, learning pathway. So, why should we encourage more apprenticeships for adults? To address current skills and labor shortages? To upskill and reskill? To seize new opportunities linked to the green and digital transitions? To reintegrate, maybe, long-term unemployed or older workers or some untapped potential uh, in the labor market? Or all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's it's quite easy, um, but it's a good way to uh, to introduce the topic, and uh, our speakers will be uh, soon letting us know um, what what they think about it, uh, why it is important, and uh, what are uh, the challenges. But I think there is great consensus. So, uh, it's a very useful topic uh, in the current uh, context we've heard yesterday and also in the European Year of Skills with the focus uh, on upskilling and reskilling of adults. So, I think we can start uh, with Jürgen uh, to have your views. Uh, how, how do you see? Uh, you've done a lot of research in SEDEFOP. Do adults have opportunities of adult uh, apprenticeships and what would be the benefits? 
Um, yeah, well, first of all, thanks uh, for having me here. Uh, I would like to start on a personal note. It's very special to be here at this anniversary because I was one of the founding um, pledge givers back uh, 10 years ago. I wasn't in Leipzig, a colleague of mine was, but in that capacity, we were founding uh, partners. And so it's great to be here uh, for the birthday. Now, uh, in terms of uh, you know apprenticeships for, for adults, and I think it's been mentioned uh, yesterday also in the opening speeches by Joost or others that, you know, even before this year of skills uh, uh, was launched, uh, we knew uh, that there was a big task. So CDFOP, for instance, in a 2020 uh, report on empowering adults through upskilling and reskilling pathways, um, we established this number of 128 million adults in the EU 27 plus, UK plus Norway and Iceland uh, would have the potential for upskilling and reskilling, and that's 46.1% of the adult workforce. So let's be generous, one in two. Yeah? Every second European has this potential. And these adults may represent the usual suspects like low education, low digital skills, uh, low cognitive skills, or, and that's interesting also, they may come from medium to high uh, education backgrounds, but at the risk of loss or obsolescence. So addressing the upskilling and reskilling uh, needs will uh, generate both individual and also societal and economic uh, benefits and, and failing to face up to this challenge of the 128 million is simply no option. Now the good news is uh, that uh, already 10 years ago um, we formed an alliance, an alliance uh, you guessed it, for apprenticeship. Uh, and, uh, and we really believe that apprenticeship is the policy option that will help us face this up and reskilling challenge also successfully. And um, well, uh, work-based learning uh, is a powerful um, uh, way to support adult learning because it combines individual skills development with being in work uh, and in employment at the same time. And also hands-on learning is often preferred by adults, sometimes also preferred to classroom settings and uh, performing sort of authentic tasks uh, while learning also reinforces the relevance of the, uh, uh, of the uh, skills development and proving that it is actually in line with what the labor market is actually asking for. And apprenticeships in particular, they complement um, uh, these overall work-based learning benefits uh, with favorable contractual uh, and uh, working conditions. Think contract, think remuneration, think social security benefits, etc. So uh, learning while earning, as we say, is also valued by the adults that we want to train, uh, since they also need to cater for some personal or, uh, uh, or family obligations. And moreover, uh, since apprenticeships also have a strong uh, function and are rooted uh, in informal um, uh, qualifications with meaningful program durations, they offer both the breadth and the width uh, of training, helping adults to not only develop technical but also uh, um, soft skills, uh, also attitudes, uh, values, um, and that all, all of that thanks to their permanent interaction with the vet teachers and the trainers uh, that they find uh, in, in the workplace. Um, and especially, this all especially implies, uh, applies, of course, to those adults who have been at the margins or even outside uh, the labor market. And they may really benefit from these kinds of settings, from, from being coached, from, from the guidance they receive uh, uh, on their way back uh, into regular employment. And of course, on top of that, also adult migrants, refugees, uh, will find this very helpful because they often lack any other kind of uh, social network in which they can operate. And we should also not forget that the Upskilling Pathways recommendation inter alia uh, also asks uh, or calls for the progress uh, towards qualification levels in EQF level three and four. So apprenticeships, because they are so rooted in formal uh, education, uh, are indeed the workplace uh, training option that ticks that box as well. And linked to such qualifications, apprenticeship training uh, does not merely address time-specific and company-specific uh, skills needs, but also ensures longer-term employability um, uh, within uh, any given occupation. And as we wrote in a, a CDFOR briefing note once, apprenticeships 
uh, is uh, not a pill for every ill. Uh, its real value actually uh, materializes when uh, its distinctive features are respective and set in motion. So those are, of course, the alteration uh, between learning venues, spending a lot of time also at the workplace, then the pay and remuneration and the uh, guaranteed uh, rights and clear rights and obligations for everyone involved in this game. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the formal and nationally recognized uh, um, uh, qualification that they may obtain. Thanks a lot, Jürgen. Um, many, many points, many important points that Lina may complement with uh, the angle of uh, the chambers and, and the employers. Uh, what are the challenges uh, that uh, you face uh, when it comes to adult apprenticeships? Thank you again also for the invitation uh, to be here with you. Uh, we know that uh, with the pandemic, even before the pandemic, the world of work was changing already. Uh, and of course, new technologies, demographic changes, uh, the climate and green skills are requesting now a more agile workforce. Uh, now, apprenticeship for, for, um, for adults are, of course, a viable option uh, to meet the growing uh, skills mismatches. And we know very well that this is becoming also uh, the, the one of the biggest and big uh, challenge uh, for all of us. And in our recent European Economic Survey, uh, more than 50,000 companies uh, uh, just mentioned that there is still a shortage of skilled workers. Um, unfortunately, um, apprenticeships are still perceived uh, only for young people, so uh, we need to, to, to change the culture of lifelong learning. Um, and also we need to see that, of course, we cannot discuss apprenticeships without understanding what is the European, what is the national or the country's educational system. And, and we know very well that there are quite a lot of uh, disparities of uh, uh, apprenticeship schemes um, in the EU member states. Now, in our recent uh, survey that we have published uh, today, uh, one of the biggest obstacles uh, that um, Chambers of Commerce face is, of course, the disparity of apprenticeship skills at the member states. And uh, I think what is one of the main elements in our survey was that our members believe that apprenticeship schemes um, uh, have this as one of the most important schemes for reskilling and upskilling the workforce. Uh, and um, most of the chambers uh, uh, and, of course, their members are using it at a regular basis. But uh, the numbers are dropping when we are discussing cross-border or even intra-EU apprenticeships. So, um, so, and other types of challenges that, are, that came out also from our survey uh, pointed out the lack of administrative capacity and know-how of companies, the lack of information about opportunities, uh, the, the lack of language skills and heterogeneity of the VET qualifications at the EU level. Now, uh, because you mentioned about challenges, I think, and we are celebrating not only the year of skills, but we are also uh, celebrating the single market. So we really need to make sure that we remove all these barriers for <laughs> ensuring that our European educational area and, and, and of course, we need to make sure that this learning mobility applies, you know, cross-border in, in intra-EU. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lina. Uh, you introduced uh, the aspect of mobility, which is indeed uh, very relevant, and uh, we are also trying to work uh, on it uh, at the Commission level. So now, before going to Pilvi, I'm going to turn to uh, Petri, who is also uh, here with us. And uh, Petri, uh, I think we would be very, very interested to learn more about the Finnish system and how it uh, approaches adult apprenticeships and, and the challenges that uh, you are facing. Thank you. Uh, hold on a second, because we cannot hear you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, we will move to Petri while we fix this uh, to Pilvi. <laughs> While we fix this problem, uh, hopefully very soon. So, Pilvi, uh, we will be uh, delighted to, to hear about your experience with neighboring countries and adult apprenticeships. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, to get a little bit of the context of EDF work perhaps is also useful for, for our audience. So, just to have three dimensions on the and in part with the particular reference to the apprenticeships, and then perhaps a little bit more broadly on adult education um, as well. Uh, first of all, so ETF uh, works as the only EU agency really uh, 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 outside the, the uh, borders of the Union, neighboring countries, currently 28 uh, countries, but also African Union, so a relatively broad range of very different countries in nature as well. Uh, and uh, when we look at the uh, apprenticeships, it's mainly actually in the Western Balkans, where we've seen then, of course, looking at also the members of EFA, we have the candidate various candidate countries that are members, so uh, that therefore it's of course also for us why we wanted to be part of the celebration here, because this is a very important thing again that we show these common structures become part also of the uh, structures of those countries that are making their way towards uh, 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 European uh, family and utilizing when uh, suitable, when useful, the different strategies we have. But we see it in the Western Balkans mainly in the initial uh, vocational education and training. But of course, that's always a first step also in many other countries. So in that sense, it's, it can be also way towards the, the uh, more broader usage of the apprenticeships. Uh, the context in the Western Balkan countries has been already mentioned, youth guarantee very much. And I must say that that uh, sort of warmed my Finnish heart because one of the key elements, as was discussed yesterday when the youth guarantee was originally introduced, was uh, that we looked at the education systems, we looked at the employment services, we looked at the sort of social uh, and health systems, but we also looked at the apprenticeships as one of the modes of, uh, to um, address the issue. So to see that that's one of the elements now in the, in the Western Balkan context that seems to be very useful and developing, but really currently, as said, mainly with the youth. And finally, perhaps on this context, a little bit on the, on the apprenticeships only in the Western Balkans, one perhaps, uh, uh, one particular uh, dimension we've noticed recently is the, the uh, consequences of the pandemic. So we, of course, now it's hard to almost to draw a line what is youth and what is adult because you will have missed educational opportunities. You will have increased uh, uh, problems in entering to the job market and various other trends. So in this um, uh, sense, the uh, apprenticeships can be actually be a very powerful also uh, opportunity if and when we see, for instance, businesses understanding that this can be the way to bridge the needs on, on one hand of the youth, uh, young adults, for instance, and on the other hand of the, of the businesses. But if I may, we discussed before the panel to take a little bit broader view as the, the main focus of this uh, panel is really the adult world-based learning, adult education. So if we look at more, a bit, bit more broadly, the the uh, work of uh, ETF, this, of course, whole question when already the word adult needs a little bit definition. So you have adults who would be in a very vulnerable situations. You'd have adults that would be looking for, where, for the way from unemployment to employment, and you would have adults looking for reskilling. And then you, when you take a context of 28 countries and the African Union, so you have that happening in very different contexts. So I'd be very careful to say something too generic about the various countries. And I think the more the message to this audience is that it's very important we bring these strategic uh, um, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, practices to our work through ETF in different countries, also sometimes in different ways. Having said that, however, of course, there are certain common trends. One trend being this, I think that the distinction between adult and, young, and, and youth uh, you have a lot of grey area there which should, should be recognised and in particular when it comes to apprenticeships uh, the, the grey area can be a fruitful area as well and, and Petri will tell a lot, uh, we've re definitely recognised that in Finland that yes you need different approaches for these different groups but there are also uh, similarities in particular if the businesses get experience for instance with using apprenticeships first with youth it can grow to the adults or vice versa. 
then we of course have the trend of the skills uh, 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 need uh, and that is quite universal and we've heard about it already this morning and uh, that takes uh, in, in, in certain economic areas in particular and of course the twin transition being the, the uh, uh, key, key element there also in the partner countries that we work with. And then we have the element of aging populations which is not only aging but also the uh, uh, question of of course people working for longer years so we have the adult population that needs to be addressed in all our countries too. Thanks. Thanks a lot um, for these very interesting reflections, Pilby. Um, yeah, it's it's a group that could be very, very diverse and uh, we need to take this into consideration indeed, particularly also introducing the, the, the dimension of the different countries and different contexts. So now uh, we try again uh, with Petri. Um, Petri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope Great. you can hear me. Yes, yes, very well. Thank you. We do believe in modern technology, which <laughs> enables us to participate even long distance. Actually, the Finland is a quite opposite, opposite case in apprenticeship training than what we are discussing. Um, we have been kind of a superpower of adult apprentice, at least since the 1990s. And uh, I'm not sure wh why this is, but uh, but my assumption is that uh, at the 1990s, when Finland was recovering from economic uh, depression, uh, there were collective agreements made in which, and, and then there was a government support where we wanted to upskill and reskill people. And at that time, we had a huge amount of adult workforce without any formal qualification. And ever since the vocational education has been uh, uh, dominated by the adult learners, and this is also natural that the apprentices are more usually adults, so people coming from the labor market, than they are people who have entered the wet school or wet college directly from the compulsory education. And actually, in 2021, uh, one third of the wet students that we had who were between the age of 55 and 59 were in apprenticeship training. And correspondingly, correspondingly only 5% of the young students under the age of 19 in wet uh, were in apprentice. So we are in totally different situation. And I think uh, one of the uh, reasons for this could, could be that uh, it's a motivation factor for the young people, that, for the adult people, so that uh, uh, if they participate in training, they don't uh, miss their uh, earnings and income. And, and we have used the apprentice both at when the companies are recruiting new people. So uh, they train people to fit the jobs that they have. But uh, apprentice have training has been also used to reskill and upskill the existing workforce as the skill needs in the company have been changed. One of the big things that we have in ahead nowadays is that uh, how we can make the whole vocational education more flexible and uh, how we can make also the apprenticeship training more flexible. And um, we have been very much focusing on full qualifications and in the name of the continuing learning, which is very much very much on the political agenda here in the in Finland is that um, how we can support that the uh, people parties more people participate in training and the threshold to enter the the wet studies either in the wet college or in apprentice is not so high as it has been and the one thing that we've been trying to do is to find out the ways that how to how to promote the idea that people can they can uh, 
study for individual uh, modules of unit or units. This kind of uh, uh, this um, uh, s s smaller units, uh, and and then one thing that comes with this is also important that uh, also the employers should see the value of. Uh, people learning constantly and how the employers can support them. And an apprenticeship is uh, one good way to promote this because uh, there will be less absences from the workplaces due to participation in training. Many thanks. Many thanks, Petri. Um, very, <clears throat> very useful uh, description of your unique situation that can inspire uh, other countries and policymakers uh, to make their systems uh, evolve. So now uh, we will focus a little bit more um, on, on, well, before. I would like to ask uh, the fellow panelists if they have any reaction to what we just heard. Um, Pilvi? I think just one general comment on the apprenticeship should say that it's a very demanding system. So um, it, we can, in a way, we are praising it in many ways and want to develop, and, but I think it's also very good, good to be reminded, and that I think is the feedback we in particular get in our partner countries, but I'm sure Petri, for instance, could confirm this in, from the Finnish case that it's not been a very easy always, and in particular with the on the youth side now that their developments have taken place, that it requires a lot both from the uh, individuals and of course from the uh, uh, workplaces. Yeah, maybe from from my side also a reaction. I mean, I often claim that uh, you know uh, initial vocation education and training. Um, is understood to some extent. We know what good looks like. Uh, uh, so, uh, and still, I agree with uh, Pilvi, selling it to people who have not done it yet, be it in companies, be it countries, be it whomever, is always an uphill battle. Although we know it works, and we know how it works. Adult education, adult apprenticeship is far more difficult to understand, but thanks to Finland, we even also here have a good example of uh, what good looks like. Um, but I think the challenges are also uh, more severe than setting up proper initial vocation education. So uh, that's why we should also focus on this. And that's why also we put, actually, ETF in ourselves. We had this, um, before your time, Pilvi, <laughs> we had this joint um, uh, position paper uh, called, uh, what was it called? The Importance of Being Vocational, great title. Uh, and in which we pushed in the year 2020 when the new agenda was formed in the EU, really pushed for focus on continued vocational education and training because it's what we need and because it's more difficult to grasp. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we need to be aware indeed uh, of the challenges. Um, so now we will focus a little bit more on, on how to promote uh, these uh, apprenticeships for, for adults, which is uh, also linked to, to these uh, challenges. And maybe Lina can, can let us know uh, from the Chamber's uh, perspective and what could be their role. No, um, we know that uh, if we really want to foster learning mobility and also adult apprenticeships uh, has been uh, a key priority for the Chamber Network. Um, we have also been an early member of EAFA and we have also recently renewed our own pledge uh, to continue supporting quality apprenticeships in Europe. But what is our role? Our role is really dual. I mean, uh, chambers are representing the users of the skills on one hand side, and then on the, on the, on the other side, we are, are the ones who are delivering, managing, and uh, managing apprenticeship mobility in many EU countries. And of course, uh, one of the best uh, uh, case scenarios, of course, uh, for, with the Austrian Chamber of Commerce, who has at the moment been active in more than 150,000 apprenticeship schemes with I don't know how many dedicated apprenticeship hackathons. Now, uh, another very good example of promotion is of course that we are also coordinating the Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs 
which has at the moment reached something like 11,000 entrepreneurial exchanges. So we are really active on, on, uh, on, um, on promoting adult apprenticeship among, among uh, our network. Uh, but what is still important is that we really need to continue raising awareness about the schemes, uh, and but we need also to have a more dedicated support for SMEs, especially because they lack the administrative capacity, the time, the human resources also, to make sure that they are really grasping the opportunities uh, from, this, from these networks. Um, we discussed a bit about adult apprenticeships, and I would like to point out again that I really agree that it, they have to be really flexible. Flexible in what sense? We really need to, to make them appeal to the skills needs of, of, the, of the users. We cannot have ad hoc uh, schemes that are just ready-made. We really need to make them uh, tailored to their needs. That's why also sometimes even short programs uh, like um, my, uh, short micro-credentials programs or individual learning accounts can be a real, uh, let's say, added value to this. But also regional contact points also would be essential also for SMEs that are active uh, on at the regional local uh, level. Um, we discussed also about uh, we're discussing about adult apprenticeships, but let's not forget that we really need also to accelerate the recognition of qualifications, and it's all about the whole process, the whole vocational pathway process. And, and I think it is really important also to, 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 to point to, to, to um, improve and enhance the, the European system of credit for apprenticeships. And we are really greatly grateful that the European Quality Framework and Europass are, of course, important tools. But, uh, but we really need to have a continuous effort to make them more user friendly and more widely known to the different types of stakeholders. Um, another very important element that uh, I want to point out is that even though uh, that we have also some short-term apprenticeship uh, uh, schemes, uh, we, we have short-term apprenticeship schemes and we have longer-term apprenticeship schemes. Let's not divide and let's be more flexible or even uh, in appointing uh, short-term apprenticeship schemes that can really add value even to to uh, to 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 um, to, the, to the to the businesses and to the SMEs, and and what is also very important is let's be also more ambitious in the VET numbers. Uh, we really need to make much more than we are today. There are quite a lot of um, uh, VET mobility has also increased over the years, but we really need to be more ambitious, especially at the local regional level. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lina. Um, we've seen and we've heard from you already a couple of elements that could make uh, apprenticeships for adults uh, uh, more appealing, like being flexible, tailored, or um, uh, shorter. But uh, I'm sure that Jurgen uh, may want to complement on this. Yeah, uh, although I can in some way also repeat and, and second uh, what, what you just said, Lina. I think, uh, I mean, the, the you, you mentioned it, the Europeans also celebrated here today the, the framework for quality and effective uh, apprenticeships. I think that is a good, uh, let's say, strong instrument that we can use, but it should, of course, apply equally to young apprentices as well as to old ones. And uh, But adults also, and here I uh, agree with Pilvi, they differ, uh, uh, not only from uh, younger learners in various respects, uh, but also within the adult uh, group, uh, which you named was also very blur blurry, we find very heterogeneous uh, characteristics that has to do with, you know, what is the life stage? that someone is in at the moment, what kind of prior learning or prior work experience do they have, what is their motivation, uh, what is the maturity that they uh, display. Um, so in short, offering apprenticeships uh, to adults requires certain interventions, uh, policy interventions, uh, which typically inject flexibility, as you rightly said, uh, Lina, uh, in the way how uh, apprenticeships are organized and how they are uh, delivered. And uh, CDFOP had a study, a study on apprenticeship for adults that uh, refers to such interventions. There's a couple, I think four or so, that uh, I could quote here. First of all, 
we have to uh, remove um, uh, certain uh, institutional barriers, uh, also in terms of the legal framework, opening uh, apprenticeship to, to older workers. Secondly, we need to call for incentives, and there's two kinds. There's the financial ones, uh, because here adult apprentices may have a kind of different expectation for a higher remuneration relative to the one that is paid for active and fully productive workers that are comparable. Uh, and then there's also uh, non-financial support mechanisms that we need to look at and that should create incentives. These are particularly outreach uh, and guidance. And this is, of course, of particular need uh, for, for the uh, the lower skilled adults that we're looking at for those who are undergoing con career transitions or those who are re-entering the labor market. So here these support processes and non-financial incentives are very important. Third element is flexibility as such in organization and delivery of apprenticeship. Uh, here we need to bear in mind that some countries, although uh, apprenticeships are open to older learners, they still require some things like full-time training, uh, fixed timetables, uh, compulsory attendance uh, 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 in full programs, and, and this is something that ad adults will always uh, struggle with, uh, with these kind of rigid uh, conditions. Um, uh, and uh, also employers may be less willing to you know, send people uh, into these training uh, settings outside the workplace for such long duration. So addressing these kinds of challenges, we've already heard from Finland, they, they know how to do it, uh, but these include things like uh, uh, modularization of the training programs, suitable training hour settings, for instance, at least for the school-based part, think of evenings or something like this, looking a lot at e-learning possibilities uh, so uh, that you can uh, do a lot of the training uh, content also online and not synchronized. And finally, the fourth uh, uh, characteristic to look at is adaptation of apprenticeship uh, delivery to distinctive characteristics of the adults themselves. So you need to open kind of new paths uh, to achieve the apprenticeship uh, qualification. And how can you do this? Well, countries have found different ways and answers for this, but for instance, uh, by allowing persons with relevant and sufficient uh, pre, uh, preceding work experience to follow shorter programs. Yeah, uh, that can, of course, be done uh, having the prior knowledge uh, validated. Uh, or uh, you may also create more individualized training offers, and you spoke of micro-credentialing and, and other aspects that, uh, that work in this direction, uh, at least as long as they lead to the same kind of outcome, uh, which should be a formal apprenticeship qualification. You mentioned mobility, um, and I struggle for a long time whether I should mention it because I'm always the the bad guy when it comes to mobility discussions. And uh, Chiara quoted Sede uh, yesterday in her panel that we've had a long study about all the obstacles. Uh, so with mobility and what I've said before, that apprenticeship for adults is difficult enough. And if we manage mobility, fine, but uh, it's, it's yet another layer of difficulty because apprentices have work contracts. They earn a wage. And if you cross a European border, even if it's in the member states, if it's Schengen and everything you want, on day one you have, under EU regulation and country regulation, you have, particularly country regulation, you have work permits, social security, double taxation, you name it. And then uh, uh, it's going to be so, but good luck with that. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, no, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think mobility is always an objective in the EU, and rightly so, rightly so. But we have to be bold enough also at country level to exempt apprentices from certain rules that simply yeah. stop. Uh, uh, the possibility of people moving across borders. So sorry for this uh, uh, excursion. Now, removing barriers. Um, uh, and uh, introducing suitable conditions for, for adults alone will not guarantee their participation in apprenticeship training. We also not need to look at the demand side. Uh, and of course, employers turn to apprenticeships you know, in situations like these. In the current context of skill shortages, it's fairly easy to get them on board, uh, for sure, also in, in the context of the twin transition in general. And in many cases, uh, employers also require specific and highly specialized uh, skills. Uh, and here, of course, apprenticeships help to develop those uh, by exposing learners 
directly at the workplace to all these new changes that are happening, to new technologies, uh, innovative, innovative practices, etc. So that's, uh, that's easy. But also for low-skilled adults, uh, our 2022 Policy Learning Forum on Apprenticeships uh, for adults, we saw that employers actually value the hands-on element offered by apprenticeship uh, because uh, that there is an element of a substantial share of the time and training spent at the workplace and this helps to develop those competencies and all the, also the values and attitudes that employers want to see, uh, especially emerging in these formerly low-skilled uh, people. Then, um, uh, besides apprenticeships, can also offer future uh, workers uh, a first experience with emerging and transforming sectors, uh, which again also improves or feeds back to uh, those sectors' attractiveness and will help facilitate those kinds of labor market trans transitions that we want to see. And I see you want me to come to an end. Um, so uh, it's only my excursion to mobility uh, that uh, ruined my timing. Uh, let, me, let me quickly think. Um, it's, it's important that uh, really there's a paradigm shift. Yeah? So maybe that as a, as a concluding remark. We need a paradigm shift in which workplaces and also enterprises have a key role to play. They really need to systematically ask for but also invest in uh, training. Uh, workplaces or uh, employers need to develop learning conducive work environments for their workers. They need to collaborate uh, on education uh, with other education actors and share also the burden and responsibility of skills development for their own workforce but also uh, beyond. And in turn, they will also get a say at the table in terms of defining curricula, expressing what the needs are, uh, and uh, co-shaping the content of the training with their other stakeholders together. And I pause here for, uh, for now. There is a lot to say on this topic. Uh, as you can see, I can reassure you that on mobility, uh, those that will stay for the workshops this afternoon, you will have the chance to discuss in depth. So uh, continuing with uh, the adults, uh, maybe Pilby wants to give us a bit the, 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 the aspect, the, the, the angle from the neighboring countries and how to promote it there. Uh, yeah, I, perhaps it's, it, it, I can easily, in a way, conclude from all, what has already been said and just take it to the, to the countries where this, uh, uh, in particular in the adult level, is uh, uh, less mature, perhaps less developed. So the first thing is, of course, awareness. I'm not saying we wouldn't also need it inside, I think, the EC, but in particular with our countries, we see that need. For instance, just simply to make it known that you can have the uh, apprenticeships models for adults, not only f uh, in the initial uh, vocational education and training. And when that then moves to the strategic level, when countries develop their strategies for skilling, for uh, uh, education and training at large, it can become, of course, powerful. And for that, the, uh, the uh, uh, event we are uh, celebrating here is very important because the strategic level, of course, comes from the examples of uh, other countries and, and the EU policies that we have. In those strategies, um, many things mentioned here, but I think the flexibility really is key. If you just take the example that we work with the Western Balkans, where we currently have now these sort of three to four year schemes, but then if we took, for instance, young adults who have, for instance, finished the general uh, uh, education but have not found employment or continued uh, um, higher education. So for them perhaps the three to four year scheme seems a bit too long but there would be a room for a one to two year scheme to be developed. And many other examples that were mentioned both by Lisa and Jürgen on the, on the flexibility uh, for adults to actually really see uh, the apprenticeships as an option and for the countries and those policy makers to see it as a strategic uh, 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 goal. Uh, perhaps secondly, on the, on the role of ETF, so we were uh, reflecting on this with colleagues and, and, and it really perhaps is, a, is, 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 is in many ways on the sharing of uh, practices and info, both with our, member <coughs> with our partner countries, but also then um, in a way feeding back to the, uh, uh, to the Commission. So uh, with the countries, I think it's quite obvious uh, already from this uh, uh, discussion that what are the sort of levels on which we can uh, work, we can monitor, we can bring good practices, we can uh, have the uh, uh, knowledge base 
uh, at large on country level, but also on co cross country level. And of course, the seminars organized together are, are, are very important. I'm looking at the front row uh, here. And then uh, uh, in reporting back, uh, the, the what, for instance, seem to be effective programs. And uh, perhaps now the third time referring to Western Balkans, because it's been a very interesting. Now we are talking about different countries, but also a region. Uh, and therefore, uh, reporting back of those practices and programs that seem to have been uh, uh, working uh, as examples when we then move to, to new countries. Um, and, and, and finally, perhaps echoing a little bit what was the Jür Jürgen's uh, concluding, uh, concluding remark of the paradigm shift or a paradigm at large, uh, this week, uh, I think it's in two days, this week, Thursday, uh, many of you perhaps in this room know, uh, already know, but there will be a, <coughs> a popular, a first, I think, ever uh, joint statement by uh, ETF, by uh, JDFO, by the Commission, by the World Bank uh, and, and other organizations on career guidance at large. And, in, and, and of its importance. So this is really what, in a way, in agenda setting is that we have a joint international voice on, uh, on a topic that we all see as very critical and that, of course, includes the different elements that the career guidance uh, uh, involves, including the, the apprenticeships. So that will take place as a Facebook event this Thursday. And I think it's very good if we all somehow uh, notice it in our various networks and also social media networks, because this is the way we take this message of vocational imp uh, is important and that this needs to be on an international and strategic level if we are really to tackle our question on, questions on skills and the twin transition. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bilby. We will note it down and uh, indeed guidance is essential. But you also mentioned regions and that leads me uh, to Petri, who can maybe explain what would be the role of regions in promoting adult apprenticeships. Well, in the Finnish system, the region is represented by the regional vocational education and training providers. And uh, as the apprentice, it's part of the vocational, formal vocational education in, in our country. And uh, the regional authorities and municipal authorities, they don't, they don't really play a role, but there is the network of the providers who are uh, authorized by the, by the government, by the ministry to have the role in vocational education. So they are the key, the key players. And uh, they are the ones uh, that are pretty much uh, responsible for creating the awareness and creating the uh, networks and, and keeping up the networks with the local businesses, with the regional businesses and uh, with the uh, the organization associations representing the uh, entrepreneurs, the local chambers, etc. And, and uh, I can't emphasize this, this too much. And then um, I think one of the big challenges that we have in our country, it comes from the structure of the companies that we have. We have a, a few number of very big companies in the Finnish context. And some of those companies are quite big also in international context. Then we have a huge amount of small companies that employ less than 15 people. But we don't really have this kind of a middle stand, middle stand companies, which is the heart of the German industry and German economy. In our country, the middle stand companies employing from 250 to 500 people or even more, uh, the number of those people is very, those companies, it's very limited. And these would be the companies that have the capacity to create new jobs where they need new people. And those would be also uh, companies big enough to have the capacity to organize quality apprenticeship training, to organize the the tutoring, the support, the, the instruction that the, that the learners will need. And this is one of the challenges that we have. And, and, and the, the, so the structure of the company, the Finnish economy is creating a, a 
with the challenge and uh, and I, I would assume that uh, we are not the only country with this kind of uh, uh, structure in our economy and the one thing that we we have been trying to do to uh, overcome this problem is that we have developed also the apprenticeship training for the entrepreneur her or himself so the self self employed people who have the who has the company and who is hiring other people can also participate in apprenticeship training to uh, either to learn how to be a better entrepreneur and how to run the business or how to be better in the in the field in the sector in the field of business that uh, her or his company is and i think we have this kind of system at least around 20 years and uh, it has been quite successful and uh, this is something that i would recommend for colleagues in other countries also to see and this is one way to support the smaller companies to start growing so to to support the entrepreneurs to uh, improve their own capacity to lead the businesses and to be more successful. There has been uh, many words uh, after me also concerning the flexibility and uh, I, I can't emphasize enough that how important we also see that uh, the interaction between the education provider, the employer and the apprentices who are all in, involved in this tripartite cooperation, which is called apprenticeship training, that these interactions, they should be smooth and there should be um, as less bureaucracy as possible. And unfortunately, I'm not sure how well we have been doing, doing with this. And uh, this might be one of the challenges that lies ahead as, as the new government will really start their work in uh, after the summer holidays. I also want to raise a question of the cost. Here uh, you can mention that uh, apprentice is a work contract, there is the wage, and then there is another cost that uh, comes to the employer who is organizing the apprenticeship. And uh, uh, we have the possibility of uh, uh, supporting the entrepreneurs for this cost, but uh, I'm not sure how well it works in in, uh, in real life. And at least this is this is a question that is debated all the time in, in, in our country. And it's of course, it's also a very political question when it comes to the labor market relations and what kind of wage policies at the Finnish labor market there, there, there will be. So there are a lot of things that we need to look after also to make sure that the, there will be a good future for the apprenticeship training. And last, I want to mention that uh, at least this is a year of jubileum for the Finnish apprenticeship training. You know, we got independence in 1917, in 6th of December, and in the spring of 1923, uh, five years after the independence, the parliament um, gave the legislation on apprenticeship training. So this is the 100 years of apprenticeship training in, in independent Finland that we are celebrating this year. And uh, we are very proud of this history. And uh, we want to make sure that there will be another 100 years ahead of us. Thank you. Congratulations, Petri, and thanks a lot for sharing with us uh, your difficulties and introducing the dimension of the entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm sure it was very useful. So we are running out of time. Uh, so um, I won't give you back the floor uh, for reactions because I would really like to have the audience asking uh, questions uh, of their interest. Uh, if any of you want to take the floor, Please uh, raise your hand. Hello. Oh. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Sophus, and I'm from the uh, Danish Vocational and Technical School Students Union. 
And um, I have a uh, question regarding uh, some of the students that we are needing to attract. Um, because many of the students that we are that we want to attract for these adult apprenticeships is um, is people who have been doing like unskilled labor for many years and who have previously had very bad experience in education, who have had many setbacks and defeats, uh, people who are dyslexic and, uh, and need assistance uh, in all sorts of, of manner. Um, what are we doing to help uh, learners get into education after so many years in the, uh, in the job market? Um. I can have a, a you not know, collecting questions, huh? so I start with this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I uh, in in my intervention, I said that the support processes, what I labeled the non-financial incentives, are absolutely key, and especially for those groups who have difficulties, and they they don't they're not limited to the group you mentioned, but they definitely need very good guidance as to what is an appropriate pathway for them. And then with the flexibility element that all the speakers mentioned, you may also find you know, entry level uh, issues that allow these vulnerable groups to you know, get into the apprenticeship. Now this is of course easier said than done. And I think that that's why it's so important that we also organize at European, and we ha can't find answers for all of Europe, but at European level also CIDIFOP is involved in organizing you know, these peer learning, policy learning kind of uh, exchange initiatives, networks that we operate on apprenticeship, where people come together and exchange those good practices. But you're striking a very valuable point that the flexibility and also kind of low barriers to entry have to be ensured uh, for uh, these particularly uh, vulnerable groups uh, so that they pick up education after um, uh, a history of, of defeat, as you called it. Absolutely correct. I saw other hands raised uh, here, the lady here. Thank you. Um, so my question is a, a little bit about inclusion and accessibility. Um, so uh, we were talking a lot about the amount of uh, apprenticeships that are open for people to um, engage with and to enroll. Um, but whenever we're talking specifically about adult learners, um, do you think that there is a, enough support for these, like for these adult learners to actually support themselves to go through an apprenticeship? So, for example, like you know, they may have children, they may be single parent family, also paying a mortgage and these kinds of things, and then also trying to go back into education because we can have as many apprentices open as we like, but how, if people cannot support themselves, how are they going to enroll? This, and if there is these services, what are they? Um, maybe I would encourage Petri uh, to reply since he is um, representing a national system to see how they address this. Well, one thing in, in the Finnish context is that, um, of course, there is the, there is the network of the social security that is different in, in, in every country. And uh, this takes care of the some, some of the things or it en in enables or it uh, doesn't enable. It can also be an obstacle for participation. It can be also an ob obstacle of participation in the uh, at the labor market. And uh, like this was a big issue, big big issue when we got the new government that was uh, formed a couple of weeks ago. Then the second thing is that in 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 uh, in our country is that uh, the wages of the apprentices they come through the collective bargaining and they are in collective agreements and uh, and this is something so it, it's not something that we in the government take care of but it's it's between the employers and the unions to negotiate on, on these these things but then of course this can be different in in some other other countries the support to the learners uh, comes two way there must be the support at the workplace, the, the tutoring, the instruction, the encouragement to, to do it. And, uh, and, uh, and I think this is very crucial how it can be done. And then there is another other thing is that uh, how, how the web provider in, in our context, how they will be supporting and uh, 
what is the support coming from the teachers and other staff of the provider, not only through the theoretical studies, but also through the workplace studies. And this is something that um, that uh, I, I would uh, encourage colleagues to to look, look out at uh, what can be done to support it. But it's a good question. But in principle, it I think it comes to the question that uh, whether whether you want to be at, active at the labor market or whether you don't want to be active at the labor market. Thank you. Patrick. At the individual level. Thank you. I see many hands raised, but we need to pick just one uh, question. Um, so I don't know who raised it first. Uh, OK. Thank you. Uh, I'm Uliana from the EAN and also from the Finnish Vacation Student Union. So uh, just uh, adding on the Nadine's question. So for example, in Finland, it is also as evident in many other European countries, apprenticeship is not viewed uh, like equal to the uh, academic learning. So for example, in Finland, if you are like in a VAT, a VAT student, you can uh, work on top of that and you can uh, make up to 1,040 euros a month and you will still get the financial support from the government. But but if you're an apprentice, you can make the same amount, but you're not entitled for the financial support from the government. So if we are talking about encouraging people get to get in, into apprenticeship, how can you address here, like in Finland or in Europe in general? Um, yes, a, a good question, uh, and uh, but it's a question that's really at country level, and it's at the what what Petri already said. There's social partners, and we didn't mention social dialogue so much in our panel, much less than I would have hoped for. But uh, it is important that there is a coalition, yeah, and that there is this tripartite element, and if and that allows you, as these three partners, to iron out any of those things that are seen as disincentives. Because they exist. I mean, no system, if you build it, is well-functioning from the beginning. So you have to adjust. So I, I wouldn't comment on the particular case you mentioned, but social partners and social dialogue will be what transfers the current situation in which I believe we see a strong demand driven out of skill shortages, uh, which may lead us only to do things that fix holes to rather convert this into a situation where we turn this into a story of, uh, uh, of workforce development uh, and trying to find uh, programs that qualify people truly and give them employability and access to the labor market to pick up on the earlier question from, from the outset. So rather not invest just in fixing holes, let's think of how we can turn this into a long-term success story. Thanks. Perhaps picking actually from the several questions, the word inclusion, and I think in a way it also comes back to the first question from Denmark, uh, uh, two points. The first one is that, of course, in particular when we come to the adult groups and if we come to a bit more uh, unstable countries that we work also a lot or where the job market is also a little bit less predictable, the risk an adult takes to, to actually go out of his or her working life uh, to, for, to an apprenticeship is, of course, a quite a major one. And therefore, we come to these quite classical questions that are in our year of skills uh, on the table anyway, like recognition of skills, that what is actually the role of that when we talk about adult, in particular, adult apprenticeships. And I think that already is one inclusion element that how actually you are perceived as an individual with your skills. And the second uh, point on inclusion I want to make and this perhaps relates mainly to the Danish uh, question is that I think one of the strengths with the uh, youth guarantee model and raising also up to the sort of 30 years so you actually have young adults there is that it's not only looking at education or employment but also the sort of social security structures health youth policies and bringing together the various actors from these uh, different uh, parts to us and, and ideally having relatively holistic approach which would then in a way help to find the path because you are quite right that once you if you have these negative images of the institutions they don't change into positive overnight but there may be a path that can be found through this sort of collaborated pro collaborated process that the youth guarantee brings about if done well well, 
Thanks a lot. Uh, I think with these two last notes on, on the need for a holistic approach uh, for social inclusion and the need to involve uh, social partners for more effective schemes, we can conclude. Um, we note that this topic raises a lot of interest, so we will continue talking about it. And uh, I encourage you to share with us any good practices or model that uh, you think uh, would be useful for inspiration for other members members of EAFA and I also encourage you to address our great speakers in the coffee break. I, I think uh, there is a lot to say on this and you can continue talking. So a big applause for all of them, uh, including Petri. <laughs>
new skill sets, new competences are needed for jobs that already exist, but also for new and emerging ones. But what do we mean by the phrase skills for a green transition? I think that we're all formulating uh, that right now, but we can also agree on that it's a wide set of skills, uh, which include knowledge of facts, uh, values and attitudes, abilities, things that are acquired in order for us to live and to work and to act and to contribute in uh, societies and economies uh, in the future. In this, uh, in finding competences, I know that partnerships are uh, very important. And we've got evidence from skill foresight studies conducted by CDFOP uh, that show that different stakeholders in local and regional skills ecosystems can really benefit from the power of working together because Together, we are able to interpret how trends and challenges related to the green transition uh, affect local labor market and specific skill supply. And I guess that we'll get some examples from that uh, from our panelists. And this recent council conclusion that I just mentioned on skills and competences for the green transition uh, it highlights the key role of education and training providers employers and social partners in including green skills and competences in the VET offers to support the green transition. And the conclusions also mention uh, the role of centers of uh, vocational excellence among other initiatives in supporting green transition. Now by connecting learning venues and actors at the implementation level Apprenticeships have a great potential in bringing about change in the bottom-up way. And through this cross-fertilization, numerous grassroots examples from the EU member states where apprentices take initiatives for the greening of their apprenticeship programs emerged. And Apprentices do this uh, by reflecting on how their occupation uh, can become greener. They look for new insights from technology experts and they network to generate ideas and foster innovation. And this is something that I am really excited about to hear more from our panel. Hopefully comfortable over there, I'll join you in a sec. But before we start, I would, like all the other moderators, ask you to participate in yet one more Slido. So please answer the question there. Plummer getting 82 people joining yesterday, so, so please. <laughs> you, you might be able to do it twice. No? <laughs> Innovation, knowledge, flexibility, skills, motivation. I say keep going as I start to introduce uh, our panel to you. And I'll start with you, Ben, uh, from the European Apprentice uh, Network. And you're from Scotland. Uh, 
and a United Kingdom. And there you are, the staff lead at the National Society for Apprentices. And there you help translate apprenticeship uh, policy into language that apprentices can relate uh, to. And you facilitate spaces to help apprentices think about what they think about, uh, about their work. Education and the communities they live in over 15,000 apprentices have taken part in your event. That's impressive. And you founded the National Society of Apprentices in 2013 uh, and have been involved in the European Apprentice Network since the launch in 2017. And that's uh, where, why you're here today as a coordinator of this network. And you also have a lot of representatives with you in the audience and uh, very nice to talk to. You learn a lot from doing that, so I can really recommend you talking to representatives of this network in the uh, break later on. And then we have Barbara from ANAP, NET and EVTA. You'll tell us more about those abbreviations later on. And you're a project manager on international projects on sustainability, green skills and circular economy. And uh, you're here to talk about a project on the food value chain and what we can do to reduce food waste, a leading vocational education and training program. And you've got a providers consortium in Italy. And like many of us here, you're a member of the uh, European Alliance for Apprenticeship. And then, Yes, everything works so well. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, we uh, got uh, one of my neighbors from the Nordic countries, Maria Christina Sorensen from Denmark on the screen. And you're from the Association for European Dairy Industry Learning. It's called ADIL. And you're a senior learning partner in Arla Foods, and you're driving the learning and upskilling agenda for 6,000 frontline workers and vet programs for more than 300 apprentices in the Danish supply chain in Arla. Uh, you're also a member of the steering committee of the European Excellent in uh, Excellence in Dairy Learning Project and part of the Danish Center of Vocational excellence, which is called COVID. And then we've got Ainoa, Ainoa Rotace. You're from Confebasque, and that is a Basque business confederation, which represents the general and common interests of Basques, Basque businesses. And there you are a technician in the training, talent and employment department. Right. This is going to work uh, like the uh, three previous sessions. I'm going to ask you some questions and I'll give you a few minutes to answer them. I'm going to start with a set of two for each of you. So the first one goes, uh, they go to you, Ben. And uh, I'm going to ask you, how can we encourage apprentices and apprenticeship? providers across Europe to adopt green practices as a part of their training program frameworks. And the second question is, uh, do you have examples of apprentices that have contributed to increase the sustainability of the organizations where and while they undertake their apprenticeship? Please. Helpfully, my answer to question two is yes. <laughs> well, it's um, a rhetorical one. So, um, <laughs> From an apprentice perspective, the question's got three different sets of answers, that first bit. Um, and one's a, maybe a bit of a surprise, uh, the first one. Uh, and the second one is surprisingly simple. And then we get on to the really complicated one. The first surprisingly uh, surprising answer, and uh, Mr. Plummer is not here, um, from, a, from an apprentice representative point of view, I think actually we need to have a dialogue with employers and that, um, that learners, and employers need to have a conversation with each other uh, about how, what the spaces are that apprentices can can make change. And we'll and we'll have, I've got some examples later on about that. But first of all, let's let's have that let's have that employer learner learner dialogue. Secondly, how do we how do we encourage apprentices to to adopt 
uh, green practices. They are here. Ask them. Um, we we have a generation of young people uh, and apprentices who have a fundamentally different understanding of uh, of green technology and of the environment and of their place in the world than we do, and we would be wise to create spaces within which young people, those people, can talk about what they what they see as being the challenges in their in their work and in their education. So creating those spaces um, and talking about them about where they're taught, how they're taught, and what they're taught. Um, because learners will have valuable feedback about all of those things. Now, when I say feedback, I'm not talking about surveys and focus groups. They are fine. Surveys and focus groups are OK. Like, we should probably have them. But they, they, give, us the, they give us the number, but they don't give us the feel and the qualitative uh, information that apprentices are, are able to give us. Um, and for that, we need structured, supported, democratic spaces for learners to decide what is important for them on the, these particular topics. Um, so that the apprentices don't shout at me. Um, we need to see uh, sustainability within a broader policy nest, like alongside a just transition. A green transition needs to be a just transition. And if you want more detail about that, I am sure that every one of the apprentices will talk to you about it at length over lunch. Please go and talk to them. I did promise some, uh, some examples. Um, throughout the network, we have, oh, and I'm not going to give examples of, uh, of windmills because we all know that there's, there's lots of opportunity in building windmills or electron electronic buses. No, I think where the thing that apprentices have spoken to us about is making sure that your kindergarten is sustainable, sustainable and that, that our kindergarten uh, education is sustainable. We've got examples in a state-run water board about mentoring programs where young apprentices speak to older members of staff uh, and and there is a two-way sharing of expertise, like that double, two, two multi-directional mentoring. Um, we've got examples of in farming apprenticeships where part of the education and training is, uh, is enabling young farmers to navigate the funding programs and the support programs that are available at a European level, because that is going to be a useful part of their education. And finally, two examples of public transport co uh, companies using the land that they have uh, that they have available to to build green housing, but also in another example, embedding. Uh, trees and tree planting within the apprenticeships of uh, of the of the public transport company so that the the city that they are serving is a greener uh, cooler place to be thank you very much what a cool example uh, we'll remember that one. And uh, we also hear uh, you speak about dialogue and the poor importance of that uh, ask talk listen and share your expertise. Thank you very much. Um, I believe, Barbara, this is, are probably things that uh, you've been doing in order to uh, uh, to plan for your project, the Life Foster Project. And maybe you could tell us a little bit how you develop training activities to tackle food waste in the restaurant industry. That's the first part of your question. And the other one, if, if you could give us examples and maybe best practices on apprenticeship that could sh you sh uh, that you could share with the rest of us. Um, you're not yeah. having any slides, no? Um, no. Yes, yes, you do. OK, maybe we've got them prepared then. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, but hey, would you like to I think it's just to talk, and it all magically works. Yes. <laughs> Somehow. Now, yes. Okay. It might have to do with the <laughs> Thank people you. over there. Thank you so much. <laughs> so Yeah, now, yes, okay, I will try to keep it like Still, this. Yeah. All right, now um, I am representing here NAPNET. Uh, NAPNET is a network of vet providers in Italy 
one of the major players for vocational education and uh, training in Italy. And uh, I am also representing here uh, the European Vocational Training Association, uh, of which uh, NIPNET is a member, uh, an umbrella uh, organization representing vocational education and training. Um, I would also like to add that I'm really honored to be here and to represent the voice somehow of vocational training and uh, um, very proud for uh, uh, NIPNET and uh, the membership that we have in the working group on VAT and the Green Transition coordinated by DG Employment. And I would like to take the chance of uh, uh, spreading uh, new, the news about the publication uh, by this uh, working group, VAT and the Green Transition, which is a compendium of inspiring practices on uh, sustainability, let's say, and including something about related uh, to uh, apprenticeships. So uh, I, I would really encourage to download uh, this publication and, uh, and get inspired because it's very hands-on, very practical. You can find a lot of uh, a, a lot information which can be helpful. And actually, the Life Foster Project is one of the uh, inspiring practices uh, in this compendium. And I would like to mention one of the factors that is highlighted in, this, uh, in the compendium as a success factor. And it relates uh, to motivating and incentivizing companies uh, to engage with the agenda of skills for the green transition. This is very, very important. And this also means that uh, vocational education and training and companies need to cooperate very closely because they are complementary learning environments. In some cases, uh, vet schools um, cooperate with local employers who already uh, have focused on uh, uh, the uh, green skills that they need to, uh, to develop. But in some cases, they might not be fully aware of what they are lacking. So we need to cooperate closely uh, as vet providers also to anticipate and show the importance of uh, green skills for the development of a green society not just a green economy, a green society. Um, now, uh, this cooperation was also very important for the success of the Life Foster Project. Because in the Life Foster Project, we had vet providers from Italy, uh, France, in France, AFPA, the most important adult uh, vet provider. In Spain, uh, CETE, it's a um, confederation of private schools of all grades. And in Malta, we had the uh, Institute of Tourism Studies, which was partner of this project. Now, these VET providers were cooperating with the Italian Federation of Chefs and the Malta Business Bureau, representing then the business partners, and they were supported in this work by the University of Gastronomic Sciences, which is the embodiment, I would say, of the principles uh, uh, brought up by the slow food movement, so with a holistic vision of food. So uh, um, this, uh, this initiated a, uh, a good uh, work, um, let's say, uh, the, a training which was based on a system approach, which was very, very important because it uh, brought uh, people to analyze 
a very big global challenge, food waste, but then it declined this global challenge into um, an organization challenge. So look at what is happening in your own organization and see how you can solve this problem through simple actions done every day. Well, thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you for, for uh, focusing on cooperation and partnership between vet schools and uh, employers, uh, a good way forward, also between countries, as we hear, and also thanks for the summer reading tip there for the compendium. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm now going to turn to the screen, actually, and uh, say good morning to Maria Cristina. Come uh, on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that you have an apprenticeship program that is 130 years old today, so there is more than one birthday child in this room. Uh, we also heard Finland celebrating earlier on. How does climate change and sustainability fit into that impressively old program? That's one of the questions that I've got for you. And I also like to ask you, why is it that frontline workers are important in driving sustainability agenda within the dairy industry? <coughs> Thank you. Um, the reason for me mentioning that the Dairy Technologies program has celebrated its uh, 130th anniversary is that Obviously, it's hard to drive uh, changes uh, in a program which is uh, that old. Um, the apprenticeship uh, program grew out of uh, an industry which was new at that time, uh, by the end of the 19th uh, century, where farmers united in cooperatives in Denmark and across Scandinavia actually also to obtain economies of uh, scale. Um, Ala is still uh, a farmer-owned uh, cooperative, and obviously a lot has uh, changed over the past 130 years, but uh, there's still a lot of tradition within an apprenticeship program like this one. Certain production methods, certain products, etc., remain part of a program like this just by tradition, and a lot of skills and knowledge are passed on generation after generation. So if you look at dairy technologists, they are very proud of the products they produce, of the production methods and of the traditions. So things are not necessarily and easily changed overnight. Uh, for many skilled dairy workers, it will be a huge step, for example, to start producing plant-based products uh, because they are used to milk being the primary raw uh, uh, product uh, in, in dairy products, obviously. So I'm underlining this fact that it's an old program because it's hard to introduce new things. It's hard to uh, teach a dog new tricks. Um, so you have to take that into consideration when making changes in an apprenticeship program like this one. However, uh, it is of course important that we incorporate sustainability into the dairy technologist uh, program because we know that um, um, a lot of uh, changes like these depend on knowledge, uh, on mindset and on behavior uh, for the frontline workers. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges concerning milk production at farm level, but we have the opportunities within the dairy industry to also make an impact on the green uh, sustainable future. So as you actually mentioned in your introduction, Christina, there is a bottom up uh, approach to these things. It does make a change uh, what uh, people on the shop floor uh, do in their everyday practice. Um, so we try to uh, make sure that apprentices um, know about sustainability and know how they can impact things uh, in their daily work. Uh, just to give you one example, waste elimination is one of the things which is uh, has a huge impact on sustainability. 
Uh, we had an example from Arla where production site at Dairy uh, lost 50 liters of uh, cream into the drain every day. It doesn't sound like much uh, because we uh, produce thousands of kilos uh, every day, but it still adds up if you uh, put uh, 50 liters into the drain every day for 365 days uh, a year. So uh, frontline workers are extremely important when it comes to driving the sustainability agenda. Thank you very Thank much. You. Very clear example of those 50 liters of milk as well. And also, uh, great that you pointed out that sometimes we just need small steps, but other times uh, it's all about giant leaps, really. So we need to uh, acknowledge that as well. Um, and about frontline workers and the importance, I think that we'll might touch on them uh, when I pose my questions to Anoa. Uh, and so please tell us, uh, how does Confibusk, this consortium for businesses, ensure students' involvement in green topics in their apprenticeship? And I'll give you the second question uh, as I'm on it. Um, we listened to Valentina Guerra yesterday on SMEs, on small uh, and medium-sized businesses and enterprises. I would like to ask you, I know, uh, from your perspective, maybe you could tell us the main challenges and opportunities when it comes to SMEs, please. Well, good morning. First of all, I would sorry. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank Eafa to give us the opportunity to be here in this panel. And Christina explained the Bas Business Confederation, Confebas, is the organization that represents and defends the general and common interests of entrepreneurs and companies in the Bas country in the north of Spain. That means that the thousands of enterprises from different sectors and sizes are members of Confebas. And the task of Confebas is to represent them before different agents, social agents, like the administration, the trade unions, and also with the general opinion. Uh, in that sense, we have a very strong training department, and especially the vocational training is important, uh, play an important role. Uh, Confebas has been an strategically of the Basque government during more than 30 years in the development and management of the actions carried out with vocational training in an aut autonomous when the industry sector has been very important, but nowadays the service sector is increasing little by little. Uh, we try to transfer the necessities of the end companies to the government. And for that, we, real, we normally we make uh, every two years uh, a study when the enterprises give us the concepts and needs that they have. But uh, that happened in a world when the transition in different aspects is very important. We have the social transition, sorry, the digital one, and the ecological transition plays an important role. And this transition must also be transferred to the apprentices that in a short time they are going to be part of our companies. Greening is not new. Eh? The companies have been making challenge in to be more sustainable, to, uh, less pol to give less pollution, and the, the greening affect to all the economy, not only to the companies. So it's responsibility to all together, uh, the government, the enterprises, the workers, the students, to work in the, in the greening. Uh, that uh, suppose that the, we need actions, but the, the actions not only have to be in the end companies, and the European Green Deal is the first uh, European Union growth strategy that provides us a framework for addressing greening and sustainability. And it's expected to have a very positive uh, impact on the employment. According to the CDFOP studies, some of the uh, jobs that we have now, they are going to uh, win, no? win, and the other one, they are going to decline. 
because not only for the new uh, technician uh, issues, also because the regulation is now in changing and I suppose that we have to be more uh, ac according to the law, no? What the, according to the law say, we have to, to work. And the CDFOP speak about the greening in two uh, phases, no? The, the first one, the short term, like a spring, suppose that we have to requalify a lot of, of uh, workers and the continuous training is very important in that sense. And the lot then is about that we need, uh, they speak about it like marathon, and we need uh, a new paradigm, no? Uh, everything we produce and design will have to be made with sustainability in mind. It's very small. If we speak about the, the vast government uh, and the relation with Confebas, we have a very dynamic, innovative, and collaborative vocational training system. And that suppose that we have in the uh, an specific principle in the sixth vocational training plan, the eighth one, that uh, try to contribute uh, to the challenge that they are uh, now in the in the world. And I'm not going to speak more. That is know that we are only have one more minute here. I'm, I'm soon <laughs> going to give you the word again. <laughs> so no worries here. But thank you very much to make uh, us reflect on time. Green isn't new. <laughs> uh, no, we always need to change according to the changing society. And we always need to continuously learn. So thank you very much to, for, for pointing that out. And thank you all for the first round. I I've got a new set of questions for uh, this panel, and this time I'll ask you just to give me brief answers because there might also be questions from the audience that we want to have time for. But uh, uh, since I cut you short, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you the word again, Ainoa. And uh, you talked about challenges. How can local and regional partnership uh, help scaling up initiatives for green apprenticeships? Well, uh, policy making, they have to recognize that there are many challenges and that is not only one way to resolve all of them. So we have to have different answers, no? And the green transition, like the digital transition, costs money. So we have to invest. And, if we, and the invest is not in a short time. We have to, the results in a long time, no? So if we are going to work in competencies, we have to invest in, in our resources. And if we are going to do it, we have to do it correctly. No? Other thing, and when I speak about it, is the collaboration. We need to collaborate the business associations, the governments, the vocational training, the social partners, the students too. And we have two areas important in that uh, sense. One is the collaboration, they speak, they speak a lot between the companies and the vocational training. Another one is the guidance, the guidance for the workers and the guidance for the young people to know what is going to happen in, in a short or in a long time. No? Another thing very important is the li lifelong learning. So a lot of workers, thousands of workers, uh, they have to re reskill their the, the knowledge, no? And people who now is uh, a mechanic of a car in a short time have to know what an electric car or a hybrid car works. Uh, but also the administrative employees have to know the new regulations. Uh, and it's important to understand that the workers are not the students. So it's important that the training must be flexible and efficient, flexible in time and in, in the space. And in the culture of the companies, it's very important to understand that in, invest in training have good results. And CDPOP speakers about it, saying that the big enterprises resolve that question and they invest a lot, <coughs> but in the small enterprises is not very usual. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for pointing out the importance of collaboration and cooperation and giving us examples why that's important. I don't know if I'm slightly changing the subject while turning to uh, Maria Cristina here. And you, we heard before that you've got uh, more than 300 apprentices in the Danish supply chain in Arla. How would you say that apprenticeship programs in companies best integrate the sustainability dimension? Which concrete actions can be taken in this regard? <clears throat> well, seen from a company perspective, uh, seen from an ALA perspective, it's extremely important that there's a strong connection between the education that takes place when apprentices are at college and what they practice when they are in the company, in this case, in our company. If the theory taught at college is too abstract and far from the real world, uh, apprentices often lose interest and disregard what they've learned. So we believe that apprentices need to feel that it has an, a real impact what they do. And therefore we focus also in the theoretical part of their education on things that apprentices can affect by their actions. For example, as I mentioned before, by focusing on uh, waste reductions, on reducing unnecessary use of energy, etc. Uh, so if you look at what happens in the company, it definitely needs to uh, integrate it into the learning objectives that sustainability is important because as we all know, what gets measured gets done. Um, yes, I think that uh, that would be my uh, point uh, of view. Thank you very much, Maria Christina. It also sounds like it's fun uh, to be in the front line if uh, what you're doing has an impact on the whole company. Uh, so thank you very much. And also pointing out the aspect of theory and practice hand in hand. You can do what you, you, wa you, want, you want to do what you can affect. So thanks. Um, I'm turning to you again, Barbara, uh, and I'll ask you how vet providers uh, and socio, socio, social economic actors can reinforce the role of apprentices from our title as agents of uh, change for sustainability. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to say that the transition <coughs> to an environmentally sustainable circular and climate neutral economy has a, a significant social, economic and employment impact. There will be a lot of changes taking place and this is unavoidable. So, we need to have people uh, prepared for this change and to thrive in their careers, but also in their lives. So um, in this framework, vocational education and training will play a key role, is playing a key role to help uh, both young and adults to be part of, of this change. And, but it's also important to underline that although vocational education and training is really work-based, it has also an important mission, uh, which is also in its, uh, in its scope, and it's uh, to activate minds. M activating minds through experiential learning, through practical learning and examples, a lot of examples. And uh, um, so uh, the vocational education and training scope is not only to train uh, present or future professionals, but also to prepare citizens. This is very, very important to bear in mind because uh, we would like to see more uh, vocational education and training as a live living laboratory to active uh, citizenship. And uh, this could be very strategic because our apprentices will play a fundamental role for the overall advancement of the European Union as a political, cultural and economic community. 
So uh, um, I would like also to mention that the first set of uh, competencies identified by the Green Comp refers to values. So the, the competence area is called embodying sustainability values. So valuing sustainability, supporting fairness, promoting nature. And this is not by chance. Without values, you can't, uh, you can't face any change. So we need also uh, to uh, share these, uh, these values uh, not, uh, not only inside the learning communities, but also with the business community. And this is one of the main tasks uh, that VET providers do have. They have to bridge those values uh, between learning environment and working environment. So sharing those values will uh, make things, um, I wouldn't say easier, but more, uh, more feasible. I would say. So, um, and a strategic role in this sense is also played by uh, trainers and teachers or educators at large. So, you must have them on board. Uh, they are the key drivers of change, not only inside the learning communities, but also outside, because they also, if they are really uh, aware of the importance of what they are doing, then the, the, the learners, um, no matter where they are, whether in companies or in, uh, inside education environments, etc., so wherever they are, uh, they will bring the change because they are really, um, how can I say, they will be able to transfer not only knowledge, etc., but also values to their learners. Thank you very much, Barbara, and thank you for, for pointing out values and talking to us also as citizens and activating our minds, because uh, as we started this session, we all need to be agents for a sustainable uh, society. Uh, now I'm going to turn to you again, Ben. And based on your experience at the European Apprentice Network, what do apprentices expect from their apprenticeships regarding green skills? And maybe we should just ask them, but I'm asking you. Uh, how can they empower apprentices to be active and become real agents of change in relation to the green transition? Oh, thank you. Um, so I'll be very quick. Um, I'm going to go for empowering first. How do we empower young people to uh, and apprentices to, uh, to to be real agents of change? Um, supported democratic representation structures. Um, I said it in the first one, but I didn't really go into it. So we at the European Apprentice Network, we have found three models um, uh, that that work really well. Uh, I mentioned Mr. Plummer earlier. I've spotted uh, the friends from Etuk at the back. Don't worry, at this one. Uh, the first model that we have seen uh, that works really well is uh, workplace representation supported through trade unions. The second model that we have seen that works really well uh, is vocational student uh, student unions that are that have VT students and apprentices at the forefront, and the third model that we have seen is uh, apprentice associations that are dedicated and specifically uh, designed and uh, and run by apprentices for apprentices. And we really appreciate the support that we've had from the Commission at the network to research that and look into that. How do they work and what do they have in common? Apprentices choose who represents them, not schools, not employers. We don't get the boy in the suit, but apprentices choose who supports them. Representation is about change. It's not about promoting apprenticeships. This is very, very important. Saying that apprenticeships are great is brilliant. It's important, it should happen, but it isn't apprentice representation. Apprentice representation is where apprentices come into decision-making spaces uh, like, yes, uh, li like over the weekend where we had Anna and Anna coming to speak to apprentices directly uh, and listening to what apprentices were saying. Um, and I didn't say thank you for, for being on the panel, but I will say thank you for coming and speaking and being decision-makers that engage with learners on their level and... Uh, uh, and yeah, it was excellent. Thank you. Um, 
Apprentices decide what's important. Um, apprentices set the agenda, and and that Anna and Anna that was that was what you did spectacularly well. Was you let apprentices set the agenda and say this is what we want to speak about. These are the things that are really important to us. This is what we want from our decision makers. Um, uh, looking at uh, what what apprentices expect from their apprenticeship, and congratulations on jumping from apprentice to apprenticeship very, very well. Um, it, that's, a, that's a tricky word. Um, what do they want? Well, firstly, go and ask them. They will be here at lunchtime. Secondly, they are going to see through our greenwashing in a flash. Um, I think the, one of the really good examples of what apprentices want from, uh, from their apprenticeships is that uh, when we talk green, we do green. Uh, and one of the EFA events that, that we went to in Vienna um, was, a, was, about, was, was about rail and was about sustainability. And we didn't fly to Vienna, we got the train. We got the train to Vienna. And apprentices, when, they, when I was talking to them on the WhatsApp group this morning, they were talking about uh, they expect systems change. They expect us to think about how we run our entire systems and not placing responsibility on young people that are beginning their careers. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for talking to us about what proper uh, apprentices representation is all about. Communication and listen and asking. Uh, so thank you very much. Now we actually got a couple of minutes for questions from the audience and I'll give the word to the quickest one and that was you in the third row. So you'll just get a microphone there and then I've got one in the next to last row as well. I don't know. Oh, it's working. And please uh, <laughs> tell us who you are again and uh, also uh, to whom you want to post your question. Um, so I'm Nadine. I'm from the board of Obasu and uh, we are one of the founders of the European Apprentices Network. Um, so I'm here representing apprentices. And I'm really um, glad that the last question was on representation of apprentices because this is also the theme of my, my question. Um, and I think Ben was also talking quite a lot about this, but this question is not to Ben, but the other panelists. Um, <laughs> because um, we have been here at this event for a day and a half now, and so far we have not heard from an apprentice. No, we have not heard from someone who's actually actively doing an apprenticeship at the moment. And for me, it's problematic. And I wonder if for you guys also on the panel, considering this particular panel is about uh, apprenticeships being the change um, for the sustainability and it's we're talking about what apprenticeships apprentices can do why we talk about we can ask apprentices why is there not an apprentice on the stage do you think it's a problem because for me yes Thank you very much for, for your question maybe a rhetorical one and uh, do we have a volunteer on this one? And I'm <laughs> Can I? Please. <laughs> this is a so this is a uh, this is a really tough question and 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 we uh, we discussed it um, in the in the preparation and we tried and we tried uh, the commission worked really hard um, uh, and this is an unusual EA for event. Uh, uh, I don't know whether our friends from ETF are still here, but uh, but but we but we were back in Belgrade and and Oliver spoke and uh, and 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 it's and it's quite usual at EA for events to have to have apprentices uh, up here speaking uh, speaking for themselves. Thank you. Uh, and now we've got one in the next to last road over there. Another question. Sorry, I, I do have to admit, I feel like the, um, I'm Susan, I'm from the National Society, so again, my question is not going to be for Ben. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I do feel like, though that just to comment on Nadine's question, I think this is probably why we are um, dominating the question time a little bit, um, so that we can have this kind of conversation that we've not had the opportunity for. Um, and I would definitely like to reiterate what Ben said, you know, the, each of the apprentices that are here, we represent anywhere between dozens to hundreds of thousands of apprentices all across the, the European Union. Um, so yeah, come chat to us. But my actual question um, is, when I was looking for a job, 
I had the choice between one job that was really well paid, um, but was with a company who were not sustainable in any way, shape or form. They were under investigation in some countries. I was a bit like, oh, no, thank you. And then on the other hand, I had an, um, another company who um, actually work alongside um, Arla. Um, and they had sustainable measures in place. Um, they had uh, much lower entry requirements. Um, and since I have quite a low level apprenticeship, I was able to get in the door. Um, they, so the, do you think that there should be a bit more encouragement towards companies that provide sustainable measures? Because apprentice, apprentices, we care a lot about our environment. You know, we're growing up in this generation where we have a bigger push for climate change than potentially any other generation has ever had before. And it is something we care about and we want to see more jobs from people who care as much as we do. I think my question was in there somewhere, sorry. <laughs> It's definitely, it definitely is. And uh, maybe you, Barbara, want to give I it I an will, answer. I will try yes. to provide an answer. I think uh, uh, it's, it's uh, something that we have a sort of gap between the expectation of apprenticeships, uh, of apprentices, uh, sorry, and what the re reality is in, in companies. And this is why I was mentioning the values, because it's very important that uh, the business world, let's say, so globally, um, has also uh, the understanding that it's not just a matter of green technologies. These are technologies. You don't need uh, green mindsets for for green technologies. You you need green. Um, you you need technical skills to master a new technology, but you need to develop values if you want to uh, have green mindsets. And these are very important, not only uh, uh, from the apprentices' side, but most importantly from the company's side. And in this respect, I think. We need to, what I was mentioning before, we need to motivate and incentivize companies to develop green mindsets, to become green in the real sense of this word. Otherwise, we just have a change in, in technologies, but it's not a real green change. Thank you. The chemistry up here says that you might want to add something, Ben. No? <laughs> Just lots of yes, yes, yes. Lots of yes. yes. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the floor, to the two of you that made use of it for important matters. So thanks for posing the questions. I think that we are running out of uh, time now. I, I've got a sign here up front saying that we've got time for one more question and it's all yours back there. So if we could please have a microphone on the back. Uh, hello. Oh my God, I've been trying to ask a question for the past two days, so I'm really happy oh, to be the you're last welcome. one. Um, I'm going to be trying to condense all the questions that kind of popped in my mind in the past two days. Um, and this is maybe something that I'm going to ask that I would encourage also the other panelists to think about. Um, and this is speaking to sustainability in a broader sense. Um, would you, if you were an apprentice, if you were in your late 20s, feel motivated given the discrepancies of the quality of apprentices across Europe? And do you think you would be able to kind of live a life that satisfies you? And um, is it sustainable to ask apprentices to care about sustainability, to care about the companies they uh, work uh, for, to care about these things? Do they have the capacity and why sh does it fall on them to kind of be so careful about all these things um, when they may be having other things on their mind? Um, why is it that we think of the quality of apprentices for young people in a different way that uh, we look at the ones for adults? Yes, adults usually have families. They may have children. They may be single parents. But as young people, 
we should also have the possibility to do an apprentice, apprenticeship, get a job, save up, and then start our own families, uh, kind of uh, go back to studying and develop our lives and not just do an apprenticeship, you know, get the job and then hope that job still exists in five years. So that's my broader question. I hope I don't take too much time. Thank you very much for your question, and I'm glad that you finally got to uh, ask it. And as you all heard, uh, it was posed to all the panelists, uh, so there might be 16 people to answer it, but I'm going to give uh, the four of you the first chance anyway. Uh, do we have a volunteer on this one? And I'm not forgetting you, am I, uh, Maria Cristina? So you just give us a wave if you want the word. But Ben, please go ahead. Uh, yes. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me, Oliver? <laughs> so in answer to that question, uh, yes, I think that uh, apprentices uh, and young people should be, a, should be motivated to go into apprenticeships. Um, uh, and I think that... So I go and see, like, like, like you said, I go and see thousands of apprentices every, every year. Uh, I am very realistic about the problems that are surrounding young workers uh, and young apprentices. It is hard and it is tough. But when you hear, so yesterday, yesterday uh, I was speaking to uh, uh, an apprentice from Georgia and he said, I've been working in, uh, uh, on, on the railways in Georgia for eight years and now I am an apprentice and I'm learning and I'm getting qualified and I understand things about my railway shed that the man in the office, and then, and then he stops himself and said, oh, the man in the office is actually a woman in the office, that the woman in the office in Tbilisi doesn't understand and I am, make, I am making something happen. He's also really passionate about making his, uh, his working conditions and his pay better. But the, the problems are real, but apprentices, excellent apprenticeships are excellent for young people. Thank you, Ben. And thank you. I'm so grateful that we had time to open the floor for these relevant questions. So thanks again. Uh, and also a great thanks to our uh, panel, both here in different chairs and on the screen. It's been, uh, for me, very stimulating to talk to you all. And I think that you've given us many trains of thoughts that we will keep discussing and comparing uh, in the future. And also, uh, there are a few suggestions from the floor for us to work further on. So I'm glad for that. And I hope that you all, uh, like me, feel that we got what we came here for. Uh, inspiration and stimulation on further work. So thank you very much, Ben, Barbara, Ainoa, and Maria Cristina, uh, for uh, giving us so much to talk about. Thank you so much, Christina, for the excellent moderation and to all the speakers, to all the people who asked uh, questions. Um, a very rich and, I would say, animated uh, panel discussion um, to conclude our panel sessions. Um, so this now brings us to already the final uh, session uh, of, the, of the event uh, over these two days. Um, so we have two speakers uh, in this session. Um, our first speaker uh, is representing uh, the new uh, Spanish presidency, which will be taking over from the Swedish presidency. Uh, and that's Lydia Berosco Rufo, who is head of international relations for vocational training at the Ministry of Education and Vocational Training of the Government of Spain. Uh, and this will be followed by um, some closing remarks from Manuela Galeng, who is Director of Jobs and Skills at DG Employment. But I'd first like to invite Lydia um, to take the floor. Thank you very much, Lydia. So, uh, okay, okay. 
So, dear colleagues, uh, the Spanish Ministry of Education and VET is really honored to be here and to be part of this high-level event and to be able to contribute to strengthen the quality, supply and overall image of one of the key elements of vocational training systems, apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are also of vital importance for the Spanish Ministry and of education and vet and for the general secretariat of vocational uh, training and this is why since 2020 with the uh, reform of the vocational training system in Spain apprenticeships have been at the core of our development the new Spanish law for the organization and integration of vet has included dual vet in any vet course with the aim of guaranteeing <coughs> quality in the education and training process. The reform aims to increase the number of students studying dual vet and to incorporate companies, including small and medium-sized enterprises and micro, small and medium-sized enterprises into the vet ecosystems. The duration of the workplace training module in vet courses is being extended to 35 up to 50% of the program and companies and entities involved in VET system are engaging in increased cooperation. We strongly believe in the, import, in the improvement of the whole education and training process and the benefit for all the stakeholders involved on it. And this philosophy will also guide the contribution of the General Secretariat of Vocational Training to the Spanish Presidency of the Council of the European Union that, it is, starting, that is starting next Saturday, the 1st of July. Today, I'd like to share with you the main priorities, information on files and events on education and training that are planned for the Spanish Presidency. I don't know if, okay. Regarding the political and thematic priorities of the Spanish Presidency in the field of education and training, the work we will carry out under the Spanish Presidency will focus on people and how the EU can help all citizens. As for the Ministry of Education and Vocational Training, the priorities of our Presidency will focus on the contribution of education to the open strategic autonomy of the European Union. We believe that the open strategic autonomy is an important goal also for the education sector, taking advantage of the existing capacities and transforming risks into potential for positive change. We certainly believe that the future of education and training should be one of the union's priorities. And we believe that education is also a cross-cutting and strategic policy. Another priority is to support the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights and the results of the Conference on the Future of Europe, with a special emphasis on the promotion of European common values and European citizenship through education and training. And also, we want to keep supporting the best policies, access and quality in digital education, as well as further support to gender perspective in digital education and the promotion of STEAM vocations, studies and careers among girls. As for the non-legislative files, Spain is going to work on two files on digital competences, a recommendation on enabling factors for digital education and a recommendation on improving the provision of digital skills in education and training. And on another file, on citizenship and core European values, some conclusions on the contribution of education to strengthening common European values and democratic citizenship. Oh. Okay, <laughs> sorry. As for the key dates, well, uh, regarding the ministerial meetings, we'll have the informal meeting of education and youth ministers in Zaragoza in September and the education minister council in November in Brussels. Then we have more uh, events. The first one, the high level group uh, in Jerez de la Frontera starting the day after tomorrow and uh, the events on education. 
But if we focus on vocational training, we have the planned a ministerial conference on vocational training, the 23rd and 24th of October in Seville, followed by the uh, Director General meeting on vocational training, also in Seville. We have other events as well planned as the conference of rectors from European Universities Alliance, the Erasmus Plus National Agency meeting, or the Standing Group on Indicator and Benchmark meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. We hope that you can attend and contribute to any of our presidential events and that we keep working together to enhance the importance of apprenticeships and VET across Europe and beyond. Thank you so much, uh, Lydia, for this very clear overview and insights and previews into all the uh, exciting work which you will be leading on uh, during the Spanish presidency over the next six months. And great to see so much in the field of education and, and vocational training uh, among the priorities. Um, so this brings us to our concluding remarks. Um, and so I'd like to invite Manuela Galeng, who is Director for Jobs and Skills at DG Employment, uh, to take the floor. Thank you very much, Manuela. So these were actually two very full, intense uh, days with uh, sometimes also tough questions uh, and difficult answers. Uh, but I think we all come, go away with uh, having learned a lot during these two, two days. I think, first of all, that um, all of us, whether we are apprentices, commission officials, social partners, member states, representatives of regions, VAT providers, businesses, chambers of commerce, we are all committed to the uh, promotion of uh, work-based learning and apprenticeships. And, uh, and clearly they are very <laughs> high on our agenda, both in the EU, but also as we heard yesterday from the ILO, outside the EU. Uh, given the newly adapted apprenticeship standards by the ILO. Uh, and why is that so? I would say because apprenticeships are very close to the labor market. And why is that so important? It's very important now that we are living, going through the green and digital transitions. And um, this type of jobs will be the jobs that will determine actually whether we will be able to master the green and the digital transition. Most of these jobs are vocational uh, jobs. And so this is why apprenticeships are, uh, have a particularly importance, particular importance. So throughout the two days, we have discussed a lot of imp very important topics from the quality uh, of uh, apprenticeships, and clearly there is always more to be done, things to be improved, uh, but I, I think that we are all together here uh, with the spirit that we can solve these issues together. And we also uh, discussed apprenticeships as a means to secure skilled uh, employees, both from the perspective of SMEs that face the specific challenges, but also from the viewpoint of big companies and of uh, social partners. And I think this is really important because what we need, and this is also the message of the European Year of Skills, that we need to upskill and reskill. Uh, and um, apprenticeships are important both for the young people and for the adults that are in the workforce. So uh, the learning effort is for everyone. So in that there is some sort of, of justice. Uh, it's not just young apprentices that have to learn, everybody has to learn. That is really the message that we have in the, in the year. And indeed, we discussed uh, this morning adult uh, apprenticeships, the efforts for uh, upskilling and, and reskilling, 
and we just looked into the role of apprentices in shaping this green, uh, green transition. Um, I think uh, we, we have had, you have had apprentices, you have had also the opportunity to discuss uh, on Sunday and on, on, uh, on Monday uh, the challenges and a potential uh, solution. And um, I think this is what we want to achieve with the European Year of Skills, is looking at what are the bottlenecks and trying to find solution because together we can find uh, these solutions and apprenticeships are good for everyone, young and uh, adults. And so with that, I think I really encourage uh, you, together with us, to give visibility uh, to, um, to apprenticeships during the year of, of skills. And for what concerns me or what concerns the, the European Commission, I would say this is not the end. Indeed, I think uh, we will keep apprenticeships high on the agenda, as you may, may have seen before. We will have a European Vocational uh, Skills Week in, uh, in the autumn, and that will also be an opportunity to give again, to put the, again the spotlight on uh, apprenticeships. And uh, as you have heard, uh, it has been said several times, there will be an update on the European mobility framework. So, uh, let's work on, uh, on this agenda together. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we can do it uh, together. I would like to thank you all for the participation and your commitment um, to apprenticeships. I think I would like in particular to uh, give a big thank you to my colleagues who always put apprenticeships in the limelight, top of, uh, of the agenda, and certainly, uh, and not least, for organizing uh, this uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Manuela, for these uh, concluding remarks. Um, the very rich reflections on the, the very varied and animated discussions of the last two days, but also providing such important direction for the way forward and the different uh, strands to be taken forward uh, in your work and our work. Um, so it, we are at the end uh, of the high-level uh, event part of the programme now. So it just leaves me to, to join with Manuela in thanking everybody for their contributions. This includes all our moderators, all our great speakers uh, who've taken part, uh, all, the, all those involved in the organisation and logistics, um, and also a special thank you to all of you, the participants, and that's both the participants who are in the room uh, here today and those who are online, uh, for all your very active participation, for your dedication and your commitment to the development of apprenticeships uh, in Europe and beyond, um, and your commitment to the work, the ongoing work of the Alliance. Um, so we are at the end of this part um, of the event, um, but as mentioned, there is a get-together uh, event, an IAFA get-together event taking place this afternoon. So for those of you who are involved in that, when you go out of the room, just speak to our support team and they will tell you where to go uh, for the next part of the programme. Of course, it doesn't involve everybody, um, but for those people, um, please consult uh, with them. Um, so this brings us to the end of the event. Uh, thank you again to everybody. I wish you um, a very um, uh, fruitful continuation of your work and look forward to seeing you soon at a future exchange um, of the Alliance. Thank you very much to everyone.